How do we find people who actually think at the scale of civic infrastructure, who actually want to propose new infrastructures, who, who actually want to play that kind of a game? Because most folk seem to be at the scale of issues or at the mm -hmm. scale of the symptoms, but aren't at the socialities coming apart. So, Aisha, do you know who James Brown is? Of course I know. What kind of question is that? It's easier. Right. You know who James Brown is? I you feel know? good. Yeah, you know, the hardest working man in showbiz. That's right. Well, today, right now, we're going to have with us the smartest working man Ooh. in community engagement, Kenny Bailey. <laughs> right. He is someone I've known for a while who's doing really cutting edge work, really getting at the deep structural issues that are going on in this society around engagement, not just around planning processes, mm -hmm. but period. And it's really helping us think about these notions of infrastructures for social inclusion. So here's our interview with Kenny. One of the things I love about the work that Kenny and them do, mm -hmm. I'm gonna just say this out front, <laughs> is that they're like at the intersection of art and politics and place and diversity and complexity, and they do all of that, not just through a project, but right. how they are as an organization, what they do mm -hmm. is work. And Kenny, for me, also is one of the smartest people I know on the planet, so. I want you to know that Caesar does not introduce most people that way when he <laughs> introduces no, them it's to really me. True. It's really That's, true. I'm excited to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. So Kenny, what are you up to? You know, this is really the thing, because he's in the cutting edge. You got to know what he's up to. I don't know. We can talk about what he's done, but that's probably, you know, he's left that. He's on to something else. It's funny that we would be talking about infrastructures for civic engagement, because one of the things we're really sort of struggling with, or one of the questions we're grappling with right now is like, what kind of infrastructure is needed for people to just make sense of the complexities of mm -hmm. reality? Mm. Like I was just thinking about in the 90s when I first moved to Boston, this area, we would go up to Harvard Square and hang out with Cornell West at One Potato, Two Potato and just talk about life. <laughs> or you could like That's you casual. could just sort of <laughs> casually talk to public intellectuals, right? If that was your thing. Right. And it was so my thing. But I don't know if those kinds of spaces exist. Uh -huh. So we're trying to figure out one, how to sculpt those kind of spaces and how to make a case for them that makes sense, given the ways in which people who have resources to help make those kind of spaces happen think about the current situation we find ourselves in. And we all don't necessarily see it the same way or mm. have the same sort of take. So so that's one of the things we're, we're thinking a lot about is how to find the people who understand the case we're trying to make and sort of get them to experiment with new forms of public infrastructure. You know, it's mm. funny to use that example because Somaz, when she came here, Somaz is my wife, and she came here from Turkey. And I mean, one day we were walking down the street and she says to me, so where are the coffee shops that the intellectuals <laughs> hang out and folks have all these things? And I said, uh, we don't have any anymore. <laughs> They're gone. Those spaces don't exist anymore. And I think you're dead on about we need to, they were part of our infrastructure. Yeah. Right. They actually were, you know, they weren't the only part, but they were an important part. Right. And I don't know how they emerged, but we had to purposely, I think you're right, recreate them. Right. Like, I think about just everyday life. And, like, I spend so much of my time in the heart of, of Boston by Boston Street because I work out down that way. And where I get off the train is towards sort of Back Bay. And it's a mall. Mm. It was just fine. I mean, it's not fine, but it is what it is. <laughs> so what it means is, in terms of social affordances, is if you want to do anything, you need to have money. Mm -hmm. And you need to be able to buy. And it's not any kind of mall. It's like first world. It's Gucci. It's Louis Vuitton. Mm -hmm. It's like Dior. So it's like, not only do you need to be able to buy, you need to be able to buy big, right? right. And given the kinds of cultural crises we're in right now and given the kinds of public spaces, the public spaces are the spaces we have in commensurate to the crisis. But I think we agree on that, but most people don't even know how to see what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that public life is not a space for sort of interrogation or a terrain by which people feel a kind of agency with which to sculpt. Mm -hmm. I think most people are just in it. Mm -hmm. And I think we're weirdos in the sense that we actually think <laughs> space. 
We yeah. think space. We recognize space. We feel agency over space. We feel like we have the capacity to shape it. We feel like right. we have some responsibility about space. And I think that's just, it's just a strange way to think. Which is so sad because for one of my classes, I mean, here at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, we had to read, we didn't actually have to read. I I found this book by Ray Oldenburg that was not even on the syllabus, actually. And it was published in 89. And it was all about you know the third place, right? The third spaces, the coffee shops, the bookstores, the restaurants, the cafes that were the hub for public intellectuals. And he argues that without the third place, there would be no community vitality. There would be no root for democracy. And and it's funny because Starbucks 20... pitches itself as the third. Right. right. And also that's only what, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. That's 20 years ago. And I was thinking about it with my TA and he said something really insightful about how the third spaces used to be the original internet, the right. original way of finding information. And I just think it's so fascinating how now we're creating this new infrastructure to kind of reclaim or rebuild those spaces. Right. And that's been, that's two decades. Right. And when you think about the internet, it's another thing. It does something else that I don't know if it's um, sort of the difference between a digital and analog, like mm -hmm. in the sense that when you see bodies and you hear voices, that does one thing from when mm -hmm. you read sentences and... Click and scroll. And click and scroll. <laughs> like literally the, the actuality of it, the, the physicality of it does something else. So... I'm not making a case against the virtual. I'm saying the virtual is one kind of actual and we need this other kind of embodied, voiced, haptic actual. You know, yeah. and so back to I don't want to sort of give up presence, a kind of actual, tangible presence for a virtual presence. Part of what you're talking about here, too, really kind of connects to something else I know you've been doing, which is this. People's Redevelopment Authority? Is that? Yes. So what is that? So we posed the question if cities thought about development from the standpoint of the resident and people and communities, as much as they sort of conceive of development as a process of importing large corporations and industries into a city to increase its tax base, how might it shift its framework for urban development? Mm. And you might hear some resonance with concepts of spatial justice and some resonances with equitable development. And for us, it's also a concrete proposition. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, I guess the investigation is why are cities so infatuated with large corporations and so willing to give up anything and everything to import versus grow, mm -hmm. versus sort of support from the ground. And so that's a project that we're working on here in Boston, and we're hoping to export and sort of build other partners to continue the investigation, mm -hmm. because we feel like sort of posing these questions, you actually can get at some of the concrete levers or some of the concrete handles that actually keep cities into enacting practices and sort of habits that keep cities inequitable that keep cities mm -hmm. or that keep cities along a line of flight towards homogenization or towards mm -hmm. a, a sort of a was it rim cool house who termed the coin the generic city was that rim cool house not sure. Not sure so yeah, yeah sort of avoiding yeah. the reproduction so, of those existing right right interesting and the other thing you've been working on this whole thing about the circ and i think these two things like both the people's development authority and the circ you're really making these propositions around different structures, different ways of coming together that actually we need to have in cities that we don't have, that right. we, they don't exist. And so right. A lot of our work is propositional. Yeah, you put out like these propositions. From a, yeah, yeah, it's true. We, we work with propositions. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of true, yeah. It's true. We, we make proposals and try to get people to walk them out with us, like to step into a proposal and then sort of see its logic through. And so with social emergency response centers, the proposal is we're in a social emergency and it's cultural and we all are in it. Some people are feeling it differently. Like, you know, I was saying Starbucks is proposing itself as a third space in sort of in response to what recently happened with them putting the two black men out of Philly. Mm -hmm. and now these big trainings that are happening on the 29th, mm -hmm. which, you know, sort of is counterintuitive to the nature and sort of 
the nature and what we expect from those kinds of spaces, you know. Right. So the Social Emergency Response Center proposes that we need spaces with which to acknowledge that we're living in extraordinarily precarious times and they have effects on us spiritually and emotionally, and we need ways to make sense of them and heal around them. Mm. And so you can make your own Social Emergency Response Center. So we developed a kit and a set of techniques and practices that people can do to make their own response centers and to sort of help us propagate the concept to let other people know that if you were wondering what's going on with you and why you feel so crazy, it's because <laughs> we're in a social emergency. Like, it's there's a reason why. And it's got multiple tentacles, and we keep seeing episodes of it, but there's a larger dynamic at play mm-hmm. out of which these episodes emerge. Sometimes the episodes look racial. Sometimes the episodes look financial. Sometimes they look political. I mean, you know, sometimes they look cultural. They look like all these different things, but they mm-hmm. all are emanating from this sociality coming apart, you know, Mm -hmm. and the distances that then get created by virtue of sociality coming apart. And so and and sort of get back to this question around civic engagement. Like, I feel like one of the things we've been trying to figure out how to find more allies around is trying to get people to actually see the ways in which sociality is coming apart. (laughs) But then, you know, I think for me, a question is, Again, it gets back to those of us for whom the social is a thing that we actually see and feel like we have some agency around and we pay attention to, to what extent do we need to bear the responsibility to try to make it public? And to what extent does making it public actually do something? Like, So there's a made proposition that sort of making public the ways in which sociality is sort of coming apart and that society must be defended, sort of to quote Foucault in a, in a sense, that if sociality is coming apart and sort of reconfiguring itself, do people need to understand the ways in which that's happening? And does that understanding then do something else? I don't know. But I, I think one of my sort of ethical claims is that we have to at least try to lean on some sense of understanding as a vehicle with which to then move forward. But I feel like right now, most people have no idea what's going on. And so one of the claims we make around a social emergency is that most of us are disoriented. Like we most, most of us have no idea what's going on in life and we're just seeing episodes and we have no idea where those episodes are coming from. And so a lot of the anxiety and the feelings of precariousness and, and trauma, black ground. Right. There's no way to sort of know where they're coming from or what to do about where they're coming from or how to sort of convene and actually try to wrap your mind around it because the sources are, are rendered unintelligible or some, some mm-hmm. sense. So. Mm-hmm. so, yeah, I'll pose that. Like, So that's what we've been thinking a lot about is like, one, how do we find people who actually, who actually think at the scale of civic infrastructure, who actually want to proposed new infrastructures who who actually want to play that kind of a game because most folk seem to be at the scale of issues or at the mm-hmm. scale of the symptoms or at the scale of a particular aspect mm-hmm. of what we refer to as a social emergency but aren't at the socialities coming apart that's mm-hmm. not that's not and redesigning for that and redesigning right. for that or redesigning to actually see the ways in which it is coming apart right. like we just got recently asked to participate in some more meetings around the future of work or the end of work Mm. or these questions around work. You know, it's fun when you get asked these end of work questions because it's one of these angles in. And we were saying, you know, the end of work is like a small way of articulating what's happening. It's the end of sociality. You know, know, (laughs) it's it's the end of a kind of being and becoming and belonging. It's the it's the end of a kind of of an era. It's mm-hmm. like the, when the shogunate fell down. It's like, you know, yeah. when a new regime of life mm-hmm. emerges. It's like one of these kinds of closings and openings, you know. And so should we take that for granted? Should we allow this close to happen in the way that it is? Should we investigate it? Is it a fait accompli? Like, these are the kind of questions we like to ask. But finding other people who want to ask those kind of questions to partner with and ally with and finding people with resources who actually are willing to invest in those kind of investigations is difficult. Mm-hmm. Well, these are the questions we've been asking. I yeah. guess, like, this, is, this is literally why we're here. It's incredible to hear you say this and to just know that you and so many others along with you have been thinking about it. Because I, 
thanks to you, Caesar, for introducing us. It's just powerful to hear the validation, you know, just sitting here to feel the validation of you saying this is a social emergency. Even just hearing you say that is so great because I think otherwise, yeah, it does feel really one off. It does feel like a very individual experience. And every time there's yet another pair of black people thrown out of Starbucks or yet another incident, you know, right now we're talking about student organizing and unionizing at graduate student levels. I mean, every single incident, I'm just like, why is this all so reactionary? Because we're in the state of emergency. Mm-hmm. And time is implicated, or speed, right. really. It's more, less more than time. It's the experience of time. It's the speed. Right. And the virtualization of speed vis-a-vis our memories, media, yeah. the social network. So then that sort of shapes time. And we get then caught in sort of feeling like we need to function in metrics of attention economy, mm. which you know. and. So all of that feeds back yeah. into this experience right. of one-offs of, and sort of keeping us from actually paying attention to socialities coming apart. You know? Right. Wow. <laughs> There's so much to go with from, you know, from there with this. Because, right. But I think one thing I want to point to really clear is not only can you, do you have an articulation of this, but you actually then start to figure out, well, then what's the experience I can create on the ground that allow people to actually start to come to this meaning themselves. So like when you do a circuit, it's not just the concept. You actually kind of create these events. Right. You know, you actually make it real for people that right. can kind of go do this. And the same thing with, you know, the People's Development Authority. It's a real thing. Right. You know, you kind of go, you experience, and you start to mm. grapple with it. And I think that's one of the things that's really beautiful about this because it's taking these concepts that are really thought through about where we are in the world and say, well, then this manifests something that really addresses that. Right. right, and have yeah. people experience that as a way of really understanding what's going on, because that's what makes it real for folks. Then right. they can experience something different. Right, and realize, oh, as you said, I'm not crazy. Right, right. you know, I'm not crazy. That's why there are 200 people in this room right. doing these different things because we're all feeling this. Right, and there's a way to think about it, and right. to have it be the haptic experience we were talking about earlier that is perhaps otherwise missing in a lot of people's lives, especially when that time is so warped by attention span. Right. Right. What are some of these, I mean, I'm, you know, maybe I'm not in the know here, but what are some of these engagements? What do they really look like? If I go to Cirque, you know, what am I, what am I experiencing? Well, you'll get it. This is so fun. I'm going to do a tacky plug. <laughs> yes, all right. <laughs> On May 29th, we're asking for participants to help us sort of enact a series of social emergencies, sort of, like almost like commercials, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. well, not full of social emergency response centers, but like just announcements. Like we're in a social emergency. Like this thing that happened at Starbucks, it's bigger than Starbucks. It's bigger than, you know, this thing here or this thing there. But to use that sort of moment in the public zeitgeist to erect a series of public events. And so... If you're interested, you can email us at serc at ds, the number four, si.org, and and get more info in order to help us make them happen. And we're trying to do them all around the United States. So concretely, if you step into a circ, you might be in a corner in the healing section doing a dance with a set of dancers that are making you sort of get in your body or a set of drummers Mm. that are making you drum and scream. Or you might be in a conversation led by, you know, somebody like Caesar or another friend of ours, Pedja, or any of these types around the state that we're dealing with politically. Or you might be in a corner knitting. Mm. Or you might be sitting by yourself reading a book about racial capitalism. So we create these spaces where they're overlapping themes, sort of the radical librarian thinking, Mm -hmm. sort of eating and cooking and being in that way, making and doing in that way and healing and sort of respite. Mm -hmm. And they all exist in the same sort of room. So Mm. it would be like, if this were a Cirque, one corner would be one theme, this would be a theme, this would be a theme, this would be a theme, and they all would be happening at the same time. And there might be times when we all get pulled into one thing, but most of the time you're all separated and doing whatever you want to do. And it's just a space for people to just sort of step out of the episodes of a social emergency to have a little bit of 
time to say, oh, there's something that connects us and yeah. it's a crisis and yeah. we have to sort of fortify ourselves to deal with the larger thing. Do you see these social emergency response centers as filling in a place that might have existed in the past in the form of, you know, a coffee shop or a form of the home of a local leader or otherwise? I mean, are these envisioned to be a completely new design? I think they're meant to give a coffee house or the home of a leader a framework to use. Okay to just program what they're yeah. doing, just to give it a little bit of a framework. Yeah. For us, it's just a contribution to those kinds of spaces, like to just have them, just have a way for people to name this experience and have a way to orient around it and then pivot from it. Yeah. And take a step out of the day-to-day. -day. Exactly. Yeah. And for us, I think that's the biggest problem that we face right now in sociality is that there's no way out of the day-to-day. -day. Yeah. So without there being a way out of the day-to-day, -day, you're always... <laughs> Right. Always sort of, there's no way to reflect on it. Right. Um, there's no way to actually make sense of it. You're just always in it. Right. And so I feel an ethical responsibility to try to build spaces that give populations, not at, yeah. the, at the scale of populations, a way to step out and make sense. But, you know, then the thinker in me is like, well, one, let's do it. Like, how do we find people that want to do it? Like, it, it doesn't even exist. And then two... I guess the next question out is, or maybe it's not even a question yet because it hasn't existed. Like we haven't had the opportunity to even see it, but what does that do? Like if there are these yeah. spaces, what, what gets produced in them? But I guess that's a premature question because the spaces don't even exist. We haven't even had the time to really iterate to that scale. Right. So one of the things we keep running up against, at least I, you know, in our thinking about this stuff is that people like you, others we know who are doing things tangentially, outside of, sometimes in collaboration with the system, whatever that may be, mm -hmm. planning departments, whatever it may be. And how do we move inside those places? You know, It's a struggle. It's a real struggle. Like these opportunities for me, I try to use them to try to help sharpen my own questions because it seems to me like institutions don't think the social. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know how to mm -hmm. better put it. Like institutions are so captured or are so enticed by the social that they don't think it. And because they don't think it, the state of the social or where things are in the social don't seem to affect it in a sense. So you can't, you're not having the same conversation. Mm. Right. Then you're always trying to figure out how to negotiate a language that you share, but it's not the actual thing. It's you're trying to parse and, and sort of figure out what's intelligible to the institution since the social isn't. You know, mm -hmm. I had this experience at one point in my life. I went and worked with the school system up in Alaska. And just speaking to this point, it was a new school system. It was in this area that was predominantly in Nupiaq, up above the Arctic Circle. And the superintendent of the school system hired me. And he hired me first to be an organizer. And he said, you report to me directly. I thought this was really interesting for a superintendent to do. And I was asking why he was doing this. And he said, look. We're a new school system. We're really connected right now with the folks, but because we're a system, we're basically going to protect ourselves as an institution, a bureaucracy, no matter what our intentions are. So we need to have a way to make sure that the public out there is organized, right? Because otherwise, through our structure, be it the school board or whatever it is, it's not going to allow us to actually pay attention to the things that are really important in this community. I just thought it was profound. Wow. Right. So just to say, like, we know this about ourselves. Right. You know, whatever our intentions are, our structure, who we are, it's not going to allow us to do the things we want right. to do. We have to organize against ourselves <laughs> in order to actually deliver what we're supposed to be delivering. And maybe that's one of the things that we've we've always th thought a lot about organizers working for, the, you know, yeah. nonprofits and community-based organizations. Maybe they need to be inside institutions organizing the public yeah. to work against the institutions that yeah. are, or sometimes it's not against, sometimes it's with, but whatever it is, you know, it's right. like maybe they need to be a higher status role inside of our cities because the way we're doing it now isn't getting us to the change that we need. And these sort of resource distribution institutions too, because I feel like that's where for these kinds of initiatives, where the rubber really hits the road is 
institutions that hold resources, philanthropic or otherwise, don't think the social either. Mm -hmm. They think at the scale of issues or tactics or, you know. Mm -hmm. And so because that happens, it's hard to make these cases to even do these kinds of tests because they don't fund themselves and you can't get people to do them charitably. Mm -hmm. So like trying to figure out that pickle, I think, is another sort of weird thing that, you know, it's always sort of a trap or how do you find resources that are so experimental? I don't know if that's the term is so experimental, but for people but not, may not necessarily understand what we're saying, mm -hmm. but they trust our track record enough to say, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm going to trust you. Right. Or, <laughs> you know, like we believe that you can think or whatever, whatever they have to do in order to sort of give this kind of work support. But now it's like, you're always doing a bit of a song and dance to make sense, to be intelligible. Kenny, it's been great having you here. I'm, we're going to have to have you back because there's a like lot we're just more getting started. I know. I feel like we're just getting started. <laughs> and just as you said earlier on, you know, the demons of time are actually cutting into <sighs> our true. conversation right now, unfortunately. So we're going to have to have you come back again. That's Because cool. there's a lot to go over with and to deal with and to talk through. I do want to just, you know, as I told you, our show is the move. And we always think that everybody's making these moves. You know, there are people out there we're inviting in, I should say, who are doing different moves to help improve society and move democracy and equity. And so we always like to ask people, like, what's the move for you right now? What's the move? I feel like trying to build these new spaces. Mm -hmm. Like, it really is trying mm -hmm. to put new spaces on the ground to demonstrate them and trying to find the right partners with which to make them intelligible. <laughs> like right. That's mm -hmm. the thing. I feel like that's the move and that's the question and that's the conundrum for us right now. Great. Kenny, thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. It was so great being able to have Kenny with us today and thinking a lot about the, the root causes of problems he was getting to. I think one of the things I struggle with both as a student, but even in conversation with friends is the word system is used so much, but I don't really know that any of us really has a clear understanding of what we mean when we say the system. You know, it's like the man, but what <laughs> what really are we getting at there? Yeah, you're right. You know, and even thinking about systems change, right? And right. Thinking about that, you know, it's like, well, what system are we trying to change and what is that system and how does it operate? Is there that, a singular one? Are no, there multiple? There are multiple like, how, ones. Right. You Who's know, managing them? Is there a who? Right? There like, is no who. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what Kenny does so great and what was really wonderful about having him on the show is he does have a way of thinking mm -hmm. that there is a system out there that needs to be disrupted. Right. He may not even know how to name it. Right. But he's really kind of clear about these are the things you can do that start to disrupt the patterns that we're in, mm. the patterns of non-questioning, mm -hmm. the patterns of non-examination, mm -hmm. the patterns of assumption that might get us to unveil kind of what's going on underneath that's creating some of the problems, both social problems or personal resistance problems, whatever mm -hmm. they may be, mm -hmm. and allow us to kind of imagine and create something different. I love that, right? He's putting a name on something that I think for a lot of us, including myself, is often nameless and yet is under our nose the entire time. Yeah, I mean, just the whole idea of a social emergency response center, mm -hmm. right? Which is, I would say, is a, you know, is an approach, right? It's a systemic intervention, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it's basically, even in the name, right? It right. gets you to start to think about, oh, yeah, we don't have one of those. Why not? Right. You know, because I certainly feel like I need one, right. right? And as soon as you start to think about the idea of that and start to build it, it opens you up to understanding things at a much more structural level in the mm. society. Mm. Thanks so much for tuning in with us today. Next week, we'll have another great guest, another great conversation for you. In the meantime, you can check us out online at themove.mit.edu, as well as on Facebook and Twitter at themovemit.edu.